Caroline, and thank you for the invitation. And um, I have to say, okay, I think continue. Uh, so, so I'm really pleased to be spending uh, the next hour. So we don't have a stiff uh, backside. So you are uh, able to post question, and I'm going to post some question to you as we go along. So first of all, I will explain a little bit about how to work as a, a futurist, how I got into that. Uh, but then um, I have uh, made this uh, title from, from freeze, uh, not knowing what to do in this pandemic to future release. How do you use future studies to actually find new ways of creating value? Uh, and, and in many uh, ways, uh, we have uh, seen this period of time as a laboratory for the future, as this, at least within a, a, in technological terms, it's, it has really been zooming in on us. Some people say that we are actually being catapulted 10 years into the future in certain areas. Uh, so um, then I'll, uh, I'll ask you guys to put in the chat field later on all the experiences that you have had with the future during this coronic, uh, corona time. And then uh, we'll have a little chat about that. And then uh, I'll move on to the three major transforming trends that I believe will be lasting uh, after we leave uh, this pandemic behind. So this is the menu uh, for tonight. So let me put my uh, slides on and feel free to post questions or make comments in the chat field. And, and Caroline will, will try to, to collect on those. And I hope that uh, you'll be able both to see me and the slides. Um, first of all, what is a futurist? Well, I actually studied economics, politics, and society at St. Anthony's College in, in, um, in Oxford University. And there I wrote a thesis on the principle of subsidiarity, which is about taking decision as close to the citizens as possible. And as I know, a lot of you are GIF members, you have a law degree or an economic degree. And I think um, uh, this subsidiarity principle was a very nice combination of economic, societal studies and, and, and legal issues derived from the, the lender in Germany. And then it was used by the law to look ahead uh, in terms of European integration to get everybody to not and say yes to the European project. Well, when I entered the, the forward studies unit and I had heard nothing about future studies ever before, and that was uh, in, in uh, 95, 96, uh, it was Santer who had taken over the uh, forward studies unit. So a new commission president saying, oh, we can't say anything about where the European Union should go. We have to create future scenarios as to inspire the member states to make more wise decision making. So uh, we did these scenarios called Europe 2010, and that was actually my, my first job as a futurist. And in one of the scenarios, I'm very proud to say that we predicted Brexit. And now finally it happens. Uh, and uh, the other point uh, of mentioning this is that it's you're not supposed to lean back and say, I told you so. You know, you're supposed to see already back then that the UK, they didn't really understand the European project, you know, why should they be on the same team with the Germans, the losers of the Second World War? Uh, what did, you know, they have in common? They had their colonies, they had their financial uh, headquarter in London. So what's in it for us? It was very much a, a question of money rather than a great ideology of avoiding a new or third world war. Uh, so already back then, uh, we used these scenarios and said to these member states, you know, you have to build upon a European identity, a feeling of belonging, otherwise we might lose certain member states. So, so that is exactly what uh, Future Studies is about. It's not a still picture, it's an ongoing movie where you keep changing the different trends and, and developments so that you can use it as a tool. But to tell you the truth, the old futurist, you might not think about it, but when you plan for your career or when you pick a certain education or if you build a hospital or a highway, you have some ideas of how the future will evolve. You might be not, not be that conscious about it. Uh, so, so my job as a futurist is to, to, to help decision makers uh, really seeing what sort of transformations are there so that they can create more value in the future 
and so that the future can get more value out of them. So uh, I think that's putting it uh, really shortly. And then I've been working at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. I've been working with IKEA for scenarios, plannings. I've been working with Saatchi, Fahrenheit 212, both in New York and London and, and Copenhagen. And uh, then I had the Future Navigator since 2003. And uh, at the moment, I'm working together with the futurists from all around the globe. We have just published a book. I'll come back to that on uh, what is happening uh, now uh, on top of this pandemic. It's super interesting to see so many viewpoints uh, depending on where you're based in the world. Uh, and also I'm working with some guys called Super Trends, uh, which is very much on uh, determining when will the future arrive. So that's a couple of, uh, they are working together with scientists from all around the world who is giving an early indicator of uh, when are these uh, new technologies actually going to arrive uh, in the business area? Some things takes a long time. I don't know, uh, cutting CRISPR DNA, cutting our DNA. You know, this uh, Chinese scientist did it and we had some babies that were born with a gene manipulation. When will that enter uh, society so we might uh, be able to remove cancer or diabetes or all these questions are of course really important to follow and there we have to go to the source of the scientists and ask them when do you think what do you believe so being a futurist is very much a co-creating process and um, we also have an app called Trend Navigator where we ask people to spot trends and then they date with the future. But I'm not going to go into all these details, you know, go to uh, our web page and look into that. I would like to move on to the content because uh, at this right uh, moment in time, there's just so much going on. So uh, before we uh, even go further, Give yourself a hug. We are skin hungry like never before. Try to hug yourself. I can see you. <laughs> or give you, your child a hug. And just to have that sensation for a moment. And I think that's important because we do venture into a society with a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and the robots are coming and disruption and what will you do in your life. And we just have to remember that Technologies are going to lift and augment us, but it's also we can safeguard humanity. So in the next 10 years, it will be about being much better at being people uh, and machines will get much better at, get, at being machines. And that's why we are, are, are left at being much better at being people. So, so if you don't remember anything else or your son runs away, Naya, just, you know, uh, I think it's really important to have that mindset that, you know, he's, uh, he's not going to be taken over by robots. There's going to be so many exciting things to do. Maybe it won't look like the jobs in the past, uh, but we will be extremely busy. It's like the Hydra's hit. Our level of exp expectations will ex increase much faster than we can deliver upon. So all that talk about us being dispensable, um, there are many things where we need uh, the human, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, this is a little bit of a Danish example, but it just goes to show on how to work with future studies. It's uh, easy in theory, in practice it can be a little harder. I did this uh, course for people who wanted to become futurists uh, on the 27th of January this year. And I showed them two articles. One was uh, an article from a Copenhagen, uh, or uh, uh, not a Copenhagen, a Danish, uh, it's Jyllands Posten, a Danish uh, paper. Uh, where they had this uh, flag, uh, the Chinese flag made out of coronaviruses. And I told them, you know, now the Chinese are getting angry with us. What do you think is going to happen? And the other scenario I gave them was, we're going to have this huge global recession coming uh, if we fail to, to kill off this coronavirus coming from Wuhan. And that was really on the top of my mind because I just returned from uh, doing a workshop in Dubai with a production company who said, you know, we are really in deep shit because the things are just not coming from China. And if this goes on much longer, we have to close our offices in Singapore. So I was fairly aware, but it was interesting that all the people doing this course, they said, oh, it's definitely the Chinese flag with the coronaviruses. That's 
is what is going to give the biggest transformation. So when you look at uh, future trends, it's like throwing a rock into a lake and seeing how many circles is it creating? Do you follow that metaphor? So, so, so why, how big is the impact? And I tell you all the people in the course, without exception, they said that. And that's because we love stories, which is about our own life in our proximity. And we think that the future is going to look a lot like the past. So we had the Muhammad drawings. You remember all the problems that gave us. So they said, for sure, that's going to have a huge impact. So I'll uh, talk to you uh, now about how to maybe uh, get a better sensation for what transformations are going to be lasting and what are going to be short bleeps. But it's not an exact science future studies. It's, it's half scientific social science and it's half art thinking and discussing what if and then what is if and you go deeper and deeper. So that was a very quick uh, introduction to, to my line of work. And you need some kind of social studies background, I think, but then you can, you can come from any background, really, uh, as long as you're curious on how are these uh, changes going to transform society. So uh, first of all, uh, how, how long is this going to be? Well, a lot of people are saying that it's going to take at least a few years before we have a vaccine. And then on top of that, we need the vaccine to be spread it out to the whole global population. So it has a long uh, distance. So already now we can say that at least vulnerable people, uh, people in their 60s and 70s, well, they're not going to venture just like that on big cruise tours or travel around uh, because they risk meeting some super spreader uh, somewhere along the roads. Uh, likewise, uh, our labor market is going to change and be transformed uh, from this for a long time. We already see it in mobility pattern. Do we dare taking public transportation or do we need to find other means of transport? In many cities, they're now working with bike lanes and, and setting people free to find other means of transport. Um, in Denmark, summer house sales are going crazy because we're not sure we can actually leave uh, the country for our summer holiday. And it's also a way maybe to work on a distance. So, so uh, the longer uh, distance, the longer a transformation is lasting, the more likelihood it is that it's gonna have a lasting impact on our habits and lifestyles. Some, uh, if we look at this freeze to future release, some of the areas that has really accelerated like crazy is all the automation, it's all the artificial intelligence, it's all the services that can be dealt with by machinery. Of course, because we ex uh, see that uh, counting on people is extremely vulnerable. So this whole just-in-time notion has been replaced in just in case. So uh, right now we are taking all these high-tech technologies closer to our home so that we don't risk again losing out. So for instance, in the States, they found out that 80% of all the wedding dresses were created in China and suddenly they couldn't get anybody to deliver a wedding dress. So, so how do we create that kind of, of security? Uh, we call it next shoring. Uh, that's a, a huge uh, trend. Uh, and then, of course, in the physical world, we see all kinds of new, of, of new designs, of new ways of using architecture. And some people are really managing this in a super cool way. So it's almost lifting the experience. It's already fairly cold to sit out in Amsterdam in the evening. So it's so nice to sit in your own little uh, greenhouse. So it can also uh, tickle the creative muscle to really move into somewhere interesting. I think this is a great example uh, of the Getty Museum, uh, which had to close down, of course. They did uh, this um, event, uh, which went completely viral, but you have to find three items in your home, and then you have to replicate uh, any artwork that they have in the museum. And people have done the most fantastic stuff. You should go there. It's just putting up a lot of creativity. And I'm right now working with them, um, uh, people within culture. I'm doing a workshop for them next week and they say, hey, all the festivals are closing down. Uh, so maybe we can actually get some of the best singers, some of the best musicians out in the countryside this uh, year to, to make more intimate uh, music. 
uh, maybe we can revive uh, these country areas because everybody has staycation. So how do we democratize uh, artwork and, and culture? So, and another thing that is going on in the culture scene is that they're actually meeting across countries, across nations. Normally they're so busy standing on stages around the world being their own rock star. Suddenly they're meeting in creative boot camps jamming together, developing new music, developing new concept. So again, um, it is possible to freeze in your sofa, but it's also possible to do a futurist release. And I'll give you some, some tools for that. The rule number one, and the most important thing to remember when you wanna be a futurist, and I really urge you to become a futurist together with me, is to say, interesting, exciting. So try to put your hands into it and say, interesting, exciting. Can I see your hands? Interesting. interesting, exciting. So whatever you encounter, the more frustrating, the more irritating, the more horrific, you have to force yourself to say, interesting, exciting. Not whether it's good or bad. The whole uh, key of being a futurist is really to stay neutral. I just spoke to Aussie Media, uh, who I work with uh, on a podcast in the States, and uh, their director is black, and he said, Lisa, I can't stay neutral anymore. I have to uh, do something about this Floyd situation. And I have a responsibility as a journalist reaching so many people. But me as a futurist, I always say interesting, exciting. I would talk to Trump anytime. I talk to the director of uh, Huawei. I, I speak to the whole world because my job as a futurist is to clean the window so people can see at what's going on more clearly, but I'm not in any way deciding whether you should go right or left and what you should do about it. My hope is that people will use it for something really valuable, but I'm not going to judge that movement. So, so I'm just trying to empower because I find as well, as soon as we like or dislike, we put huge blinders on ourselves. So while you're a futurist, you say interesting, exciting. But uh, Naya, I'm also a mother of four children and I go in my mother role as well. And I don't say interesting, exciting. You know, I'm fairly strict with how much time they should spend on their screen and they should look at their homework. And so I'm, I'm also a completely normal person. But, but while I enter the futurist scene, I say interesting, exciting. So you have to spend more time in, in this space of, of curiosity. This is from Singapore Park. Let's keep Singapore healthy. For your own safety and for those around you, please stand at least one meter apart. So it's super interesting to see because we see a lot of cultural differences in uh, how much do we like these robots. Uh, in uh, a lot of uh, westernized countries, we don't really like them because we have seen too, too, too many two Terminator movies. We think that they will kill us and take over the world. Where if you look to the more Asian uh, regions, they love this new technology and they know that it's gonna come in and help them. Saying that, a new survey shows that we've become far more friendly towards having these uh, agents to help us uh, maintain distance for hygiene, all these uh, jobs. And then you say interesting, exciting, of course. Now we spoke about uh, this uh, situation um, around Floyd can't breathe. Uh, and what I think is important is that it's not only uh, technology bringing around the future, it's very much the culture as well. And right now, what we see is that we get this whole movement. Uh, my daughter, who's 10 years old, she's talking about racism with her friends. She makes TikTok videos all the time. And she just noticed that all the people she's following have this uh, Black Lives Matters on. And she's so involved. And she was so involved in, in this whole situation. And now she came and told me, but this policeman, he can't go outside now because people are saying they will shoot him if he walks into the street. But isn't that the court that has to decide that he should be killed? And so she's all involved in this. But it's amazing how uh, Corona has given us a common enemy and somehow we are standing on the same side and we have never 
been traveling so little, but at the same time, we have never been visiting so many cultures and been so interested in what other people are doing around the world. We are following all these influences from all around the place. We saw it in, in the Me Too movement. We saw it here. We saw it with Greta. And, and that's also a very interesting transforming uh, trend to follow, especially because we can see, oh, time is running. We can see that, that uh, in terms of democracy, we're having much more elderly people in the westernized countries like uh, China also, but America, uh, Europe, uh, they're growing old. So young people, they can't, they can't win in a democratic process. There are some young people already saying, can we put down, please, the voting age to 15? And could we please uh, take away the voting rights for people who are above 80? So, so there are some uh, movements going on there. Will the democratic system actually represent us very well? And then as a futurist, you should always look at the taboos. And here we have seen some very interesting taboos. So when you uh, have uh, your... Uh, become a grandmother or whatever, of course you want to visit your grandchild. Well, during this period of time, it has not been possible to visit these uh, newborn babies because everybody had to keep their distance. And they have actually made surveys now that they show that these newborn babies put on much more weight that mothers are actually managing to get the breastfeeding going because they don't have all these visitors. I think that's super interesting that we have a crisis like that. And then it's like, hey, it's actually much better to leave a mother and her newborn alone so she can have her herbal tea and she can get her breastfeeding going rather than putting flowers and making teapots and whatever. Likewise, in the kindergarten, 96% um, of all Danish kids are in kindergarten. Well, it used to be uh, 45 minutes to one and a half hour for these uh, um, school teachers to allow the parents in with the kids in the morning, there would always be a worried mother who would sit and hold on to a child which would be crying. These days they can't get in, you, you know, you just give your child and you leave. And what they tell me is that it's very contagious. So if there's one mother sitting with her child for one and a half hour, then the other mothers will say, hey, I need to be a good mother as well. So I'm also gonna spend half, one and a half hour leaving my child at the daycare. So, so they have been spending three hours a day for people collecting and bringing their kids. And now it's just going completely seamless. And by the way, they don't have any snot hanging out of their nose anymore because they wash their hands. So, so new habits, are coming out as well. And that's what I call taboo hunting. Uh, what is actually working? For instance, I'm speaking blah, blah, blah here, but now you actually have the chance to collectively augment this whole conference because you can actually bring in nice ideas and associations. So I look so much forward to, to reading all the stuff that you're writing there afterwards. So, so we are creating some kind of, of collective augmentation here. Oh, um, so finally, uh, you can't just read about the future, you have to go to bed with it. What do I mean by that? Well, you actually have to taste and feel it. If you only uh, read newspaper articles and, and follow whatever other people are doing, you don't get a real sensation. So again, I think that's really key. You have to feel it with your whole body. So, so um, I saw that we're having more deep fake episodes so people can basically videotape you and then they can abuse your face for saying all kinds of things that you have never said. Well, then you say, interesting, exciting, and then uh, you try it out yourself. So of course I downloaded this uh, app from China and uh, I realized, hey, Lisa, you can, you can actually video cam yourself when you look good in the afternoon, your hair is nice and you have a nice dress on, you put on your makeup. And then when you have morning meetings where you look hor horrible, this morning I had one of these folders in my skin because I was lying wrong on the pillow. It, I think it lasted until midday. And then if I had a meeting, I could just put my straight face I've been speaking on my behalf. I could be a man applying for jobs. Or I could come as this uh, robot, Sophia, who already has a citizenship in Saudi Arabia. So, Playing around with it is really, really key. And I can't go much into deep with this, but I'm always asking people, how do you want to get to bed with the future? How are you going to make experiments so you get much deeper into what will it actually mean to you? 
I went to Sweden uh, because they have been far more open than Denmark. So I actually went there on a research trip trying to find out how are hotels going to act once we open up. There will not be buffets. Uh, it will be the young waiters serving you the food. The elderly people working in the hotel will do all the back office work. So I had so many insights just from being there. I call it listening louder. You can just not find out by, by just uh, reading about it in a distance. You have to experience it yourself. That is why you might get shocked about the social points in China, but go there, experience it, understand what it means. I spoke to a Portuguese guy. He, he lost his uh, wallet in a Chinese train and he said half an hour later it was delivered in my hotel. It would never have happened in Lisbon. You know, there's really control and tracking uh, working very well. Oh, this one, uh, I think that is interesting for your son because he will grow up with this. Uh, but uh, this is just to give you another example, uh, like we can do any color, mix any color with a, a few ground colors. Uh, some uh, researchers in a university in Japan has just discovered that they can actually find the tasters and then they can uh, create any taste you like by uh, licking on your screen. So if your son wants an ice cream, he can lick on the screen and he can taste exactly how that, that ice cream tastes. Or I don't know what to have and then you can actually lick your way through the menu card. I don't know how it's going to be applied, but I think it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's because uh, I, I put so many new things in, so I didn't know how, how long it's gonna take. Uh, this one, very fast, Accenture has moved all their higher recruiting into virtual reality. So already when you pick your avatar and choose what task to do, they start to assess you and you have to solve. I don't know if you know these uh, panic rooms where you have to solve riddles in order to get out. They have created that online and it's working so much better than the traditional job interview that they say we keep that. Adoptive parents, they are using virtual reality to see what traumas the child has been through before getting the child home. They actually see the abuse, they see the violence, uh, they see uh, all these things so that they get an emotional attachment to the, what the child has been through and they start to coping because a lot of them actually have huge problem. Uh, they want to have this child, uh, but they have no idea uh, what sort of um, memories they're getting inside. And this is a way of, of, of bonding these children uh, to their parents. So, so great new stuff uh, happening also on, on this uh, scene. So my question to you guys now is how have you been experienced, uh, experienced, uh, with the, experienced with the future? Um, or have you experienced something where you said, hey, that's surprising, also a taboo maybe? How? Will you just write about it in the chat? That would be really great. And then I'm just gonna turn off my slides uh, for a moment and then we'll return when I go back to the three trends. Mm. Da, da, da. Yeah, uh, let me see. We have any chats, Caroline? Not no any chats any yet, but uh, feel free to discuss how have uh, how has work been done. Have if you, you want to say something? Just unmute yourself. Oh no, you have to put your hand up, and then Caroline will pick you. I think there's a reaction thingy. No, I don't know how to put you your hand. Can up. put reaction, and I'll just try to raise my hand. Yeah. Hello. So uh, at least uh, you know everybody. Uh, uh, online here has uh, tried working from home in a different way. Will you discuss a little bit about how that's going to go? I'm coming to that. Maybe I should just do my presentation, but I really would love you to, to bring in any thoughts and ideas. I hope that I've given you a few uh, tools, glasses to, to, to get a hold on, on uh, that the future is not some weird things that the world has never seen before. Uh, but it's whenever it's having this transforming power in the way we prioritize our life, live our life.
So I one. just wanted to ask you yeah. before I start bombarding you. We have one who's tried the, to download the auto augmented reality games and see how it works. Uh, is this something that will be every day? Henrik Bum, will you talk a little bit about it, just two minutes? What did you get out of it? Did you get dizzy? How did it feel? You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I got this uh, new iPad uh, Pro and uh, one of the nice features with that device is exactly that they have started to uh, allow users actually to, uh, to use more and more AR uh, apps. And uh, I know that a lot of uh, uh, apps developer are looking into how can you actually integrate the uh, e AR more in kind of their promotions and for instance I, I would I would guess IKEA or some of the the big furnace furniture uh, sale, uh, sales uh, would actually think that it would be nice that you can actually use your iPad to actually imagine how your kitchen or uh, living room would uh, would look like so uh, it's just a fun little uh, tool. I'm still a little bit scared that my kids would take the iPad out of my hand and start walking around in the garden with it, but, uh, but it's, it's nice. Cool. Awful fun at this point, but it will probably be more in, in moving forward. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. We also had a silent disco here, which is fantastic. Sane, what were your uh, experience with that? Because you have to, I have been to a silent dis disco, but it's really one of the things that you have to try in order to understand it. It's so cool that you have the music and then you dance and then you take it off and it's completely silent. And the DJs are competing on who plays the nicest music because they can see whether it's green, red or yellow, what music you're listening to. So they're fighting each other, uh, keeping you going. And then you find people who are listening to the same music and you dance with those and you can just have deep chats with people uh, because everybody else is dancing. So, so it's really a, a game changer for, for the nightclub scene. So that's, yeah. that's also it, so cool. Exactly, because it, was, it is my daughter, she's studying at the IT University and they were planning all the new students activities, you know, for the new students for the next year. And then one of the activities that they were supposed to have was silence disco. And then they were sitting discussing how are we going to do that when we can't do it. Then they came up with this silent disco, virtual silent disco. Where instead of, you know, everybody's silent, just moved it, but then somebody started dancing and you have to guess which song it was they were dancing to, which music it was. And it was so much fun. And they came up within that hour with so many different ways to do stuff. So it was, uh, it was amazing. So I just thought that was fun. I'm going to use it right away tomorrow at a business meeting. So <laughs> good. Yeah. Uh, can you do a recording, Sam? I would like to see that. I will. I will. I promise. <laughs> I think that's a, a nice icebreaker. Okay, so uh, should we, um, should we uh, move on? But uh, what we can uh, see from here is that it's great having kids in all ages <laughs> to trend spot uh, for sure, because they are growing up as the next generation on the labor market. And they expect that uh, we have a fast internet connection and that things are happening in virtual reality. So no doubt, you know, our business meeting is going to be avatars like the gamers have uh, that are discussing, walking around, meeting, uh, seeing stuff. So let me move back to um, the keynote here. Uh, uh, uh. And while we do that, I'll just, just post it that you can feel free to keep the questions coming and Lisa will have more time to answer any questions you may have at the end of the session. And uh, she's promised to hang on for those of you who uh, feel like more. For sure. One of the big uh, transformations that are happening globally is from work life to life work balance. What does that mean? Well, it means that you might have a vulnerable family member. It means that you have been spending uh, time at home for long enough to find out, hey, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> My brain does not start working till 11 o'clock at night uh, in the morning. Uh, maybe at night. Um, maybe you have some some uh, business meeting. Uh, I went to green school in Bali not long ago, and, and Denmark was not getting up till two o'clock in the afternoon, which was fantastic because then you could do other things, and then you could decide uh, when actually to work. So this whole digital nomad, it was already on the way. Uh, Forbes came out with a study in February saying, well, the next generation at the labor market, they want to completely decide uh, when to work, where to work, and how to work. 
And that is one of the areas which has completely accelerated uh, during this time. And uh, a business like Twitter has said, well, you don't need to come into work ever if you don't want to. And that is maybe uh, pushing it a little bit far. Uh, nevertheless, I would be concerned if I am um, the logistic managers of these uh, big corporations uh, with a lot of uh, furnitures and a lot of offices uh, asking myself, you know, how much do we need also in environmental terms? Um, and, and people have also had a taste of, of different mobility patterns. As I said before, summer houses are going crazy in Denmark, but we also see a tendency that you might have complete villages moving out. So you have young people, they're already knowing each other from online communities. They've been gaming throughout their life. They say, hey, I don't want to have neighbors that I don't know. Uh, you know, I'll put together my own village of thousand people. And then we move a little bit out of the big cities and we get a cheaper housing rate and we can live sustainable. It takes a village to raise a child. We have zero monogamy. So, so new logics are coming into place, really pushing the traditional industrial logic that everybody gets in at the same time and leave at the same time. It's very interesting uh, to see. Um, another point that uh, we have noticed in the Scandinavian countries, and I do not know whether this is a global thing, is that we have for a long time said, oh, we wish that the men took maternity leave because then we would have more equality at the labor market because then you have both men and women being able to take care of the kids and go shopping and do the cooking and fix things rather than the men only spending time with their kids later in the evening when they get back from work. Well, they have now been spending a lot of time together with kids at all ages, these guys. And we see a trend that they do not want the mother to grow up the child alone. They want to have that quality time themselves. They have really enjoyed having this playful time, having uh, long walks with their children, uh, going to places, doing other stuff. Uh, with them. So it's also uh, a change, you could say, where the push is suddenly coming from the guys rather than women uh, complaining. Uh, we actually see a, a, a trend where the men are uh, saying, hey, we need to carve out some, some space for us at the labor market. Then you have completely uh, new jobs. We have already a situation where 40% uh, live by themselves. So this individuality trend is huge and People who have been single in this period of time had a hard time because uh, you had to keep the social distance. And I think uh, this mukbang trend is super interesting. Uh, so, so basically she's eating at seven o'clock at night. You can have dinner with her after this session. And uh, she's basically talking about what she's cooking and then she's just eating. And uh, it's giving people appetite not to sit by themselves and eat. And I just think it's a great example of a job that you probably wouldn't have told your child that uh, this is what you should do when you grow up. also give a feedback crisis uh, in the sense that uh, the stuff that is really hard to do online is uh, politics, difficult political uh, discussions. We know some European politicians who said it's really, really hard to, to solve the disagreements online. Uh, you really need to meet. And the same goes for innovation. Um, there is another thing uh, in this uh, feedback crisis. For a long time, it was just the fact that we didn't want to call each other because then people answer back. It's much easier to send a text message. Now we have uh, shrunk the meetings down to 15 minutes from one hour meetings and it's nice and it's efficient and you get things done. But all the stuff that you don't know, you don't know, you can't live without. That's what you're missing. And that's the stuff where you need to be around. You need to be there. And uh, I'm thinking now, especially Naya, for the next generation as well of kids 
who have a hard time going into apprenticeship, they need to see adults doing things in order to learn the skills themselves, whether it's being a young lawyer or anything else. So we risk losing this young generation on the floor unless we really uh, manage to, to build some, some innovative teams. And it's not just the corona having uh, created this movement. Uh, you know, Alexia, Google, all these, where you talk to them, uh, they will be our preferred companionship. Something that has happened during uh, Corona is that artificial intelligence, for instance, moving into Alexia, it can recognize your mood, it can recognize what you need, and it will coach you and it will talk to you. So it might be much easier to have discussions. Have you seen the movie Her? It's a sci-fi movie. You can you can watch it at any point. It's, it's I'm sure it's lying online. But, but we're getting close to that ability. And we know that laziness has always been a huge driving force for humankind. So if it's easier to have a coach, uh, which is a voice recognition, we might go for that. In Germany, uh, it, it used to be the dual cell batteries that had maybe 80% uh, of the market share. And now uh, the Germans say, I need batteries. And where do you think you get the batteries from? Amazon. So they have also taken over the market share. So I'll just uh, play this uh, uh, video for you just to, to give you uh, some thinking about how will we communicate in this future. It might be easier for us not to meet in the short term, but what will happen in the long term? And maybe you can reflect on that uh, on the chat. Playing jazz. Playing jazz. Smoothie. Making smoothie. Calendar. No meetings today. Remember, dentist at 9.30. Fire off. Fire off. Open door. Door open. And we're going to do one more. Fire. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open. Open door. Repeat that. Open door. I didn't understand that. Open door! Play on the floor. Sing on the floor. Get on the floor! Open the door! Open the door! Open the door! Open the door! I'd been single for a while, but my friends just wouldn't stop getting married and having babies. It seemed like everybody was hashtag blessed. Instead of getting an engagement ring, I just got the pictures. Now I have a perfect hubby and three little angels and pomegranate puree for breakfast every morning. <laughs> I've never seemed happier. So you have this situation where people uh, publish themselves online like complete crazy where LinkedIn say you don't have to apply for jobs, we'll find you, you know, our algorithm will find you if you're lucky. So, so we have this uh, feedback crisis. That is my first thing that you, th I think that you should learn how to manage. So I'll end every trend with something that I think you have to deal with. So what is the feedback that we only get from social media or gaming? What is that doing to us meeting only in virtual space? Um, so uh, people in the future that will succeed are people who are a part of a caring team. Not more people than can share two pizzas. So it's one, not one of these uh, 200 people sitting in a lecture theater, uh, but people who can actually just address taboos, who can help each other, almost like diving, where you would never go underwater unless you had a body with you. So you check out each other's equipment. That is a key element in the future, also because the things you need to solve is so complex. So you need other elements in this puzzle. You need it to listen louder, and you need it in order to this uh, just in case. It's not just about delivering in time, being extremely efficient. It's also about having a buffer. If the next waves happens, if something uh, is not working out, you need to be able to put your team together. So I think that's a, a key competence to, to bring into this future. And that's maybe it seems uh, strange, but it's very often when you look at future trends, people have to go opposite in order to create some value out there because the machines will be very good at doing the other stuff. We will have algorithms summarizing completely what did we talk about tonight. It's how are we going to deal with it, which is important. Okay, time is running, so I'm um, sorry, but uh, I'll, I'll move to this one, but I think this is really interesting. Uh, in Danish, it's from 
indlæggelse til hjemlæggelse, from hospitals to health at home, uh, also a big trend, which has really broken the barrier where we talked about privacy, because uh, suddenly it's, it's a public issue. Uh, you're not a hero from not turning up with a cold at your job, you know, just stay at home. You have an obligation, it's like, uh, It used to be a private thing whether you were smoker or not. These days, it's no longer a private thing whether you are healthy or not. It would be your challenge and you will have all these uh, face recognitions, elements uh, watching out for you. You will have your own uh, monetization. Apple and Google are making this uh, for, for Corona where they say you should be in charge of that data. Other countries want it to be at the national level, but we all have it. Uh, so that, of course, we want to know, am I having cancer? Am I, should I do this or should I do that? All this preventive insight. So there's a huge um, pull to get this information. So we might talk about privacy, but our health and staying healthy, staying ahead of the curve is more important to us. So we're going to sell out of our privacy in order to get this kind of feedback. We saw strangers shielding strangers from a hail of gunfire on the Las Vegas Strip. So, my point here is that you will get a digital, smarter version of yourself. It will coach you like Alexia, but it will be far more tailored to your DNA, your bloodstream. It can even read your mind. Uh, your, your, your state of mind, it can notice whether your mood is changing, it can measure whether you're moving into depression, stress level, whether you're in love, it will be used for matchmaking, it will be used for all kinds of things. It starts out with a basic health element and then we add things on. But imagine that we will have a health room in the future or we will have a health area. Some of it will be highly rational, but as we're taking telehealth uh, to our own place, there's going to be a lot of emotional stuff in it. There's going to be a lot of spiritual stuff in it. There's going to be a lot on how to control your own mindset. And I'm sure we're going to have different sub-communities. Already now, people do not listen to health authorities. They listen to influencers. On top of that, we're going to have this whole evidence layer on what works and what doesn't work. Imagine, and I think a lot of people in this webinar now tonight will be a super spreader because super spreaders are the one who are very outgoing, meeting different groups of people. So already I have four children and, the, and I travel a lot. So I'll, I'll be a super spread person from hell. So basically people will be warned against talking to me in the very near future because they can see, okay, she's really bad news. Uh, she could uh, bring you all kinds of terrible things. Uh, so, so we will have this uh, virtual layer around us as we go. Insurance companies are using this, so you can just talk to the camera and say what has been stolen. And a detector will say whether you've been lying or not reporting your loss. Uh, so you don't actually have to write in any files anymore. So it's being applied to all kinds of businesses. Sorry, I'm rushing because I really want us to have time for the questions too. The final one is from onlooker to creator. And I think uh, looking at society, we have a lot of people who are binging, who are losing their sleep, uh, because especially in the beginning of Corona, there were so many things going on. So you're just completely paralyzed. But we also have a lot of uh, professionals out there who try to make us binge. Uh, Netflix has been out saying that their biggest competitor is our good night's sleep. There has been people measuring on what it actually costs in production rate that everybody walks around what is similar uh, to having a hangover uh, because they don't get their sleep, because they never go deep in the learning. Uh, you have a higher education and, and actually sticking to the same subject for a long time, going deep. Uh, saying no to a lot of things. It's a skill that is so challenged these times. But I think looking at the cultural scene from X Factor being the big show, uh, the magnet drawing everybody to look at who was the best singer in the nicest dress, suddenly it's uh, being together apart, uh, community singing on the Friday night. It strikes a completely different core in us. And that's why you have to notice 
What does it do to our culture when a crisis like this happens? And is it going to stay like that? We somehow, I don't think we can go back to the X factor reality. We have to move on to a new level uh, somehow. And that is really uh, interesting in this period. You have had uh, people moving from uh, profession to professionals um, because they had to put in whatever skills they had. So Novo Nordic had for a long time these UV uh, creating um, hygiene, removing bacteria. And uh, then this guy, he said, well, I can use that skill for the daycare so they don't have to put... Uh, sanitizer uh, spirits everywhere. They can just uh, use these UV uh, lasers instead. So we've seen so many um, professional boundaries breaking down. And I think uh, for the next generation entering the labor market, they want to be a part of an innovative team where you uh, look at society, you see what problems do we have, what challenges, and how can I get in and solve some of these things, rather than looking traditional at what education do I have? My profession is this or that. I'm a lawyer or I'm an economist and I want to stay within accounting or I want to stay within. So, so we are breaking down uh, barriers. Um, and then I put the, the well-being budget in the corner, which I think is interesting because we might well move from measuring uh, economic wealth to using all these data points to measure the well-being of people. They're already doing it in New Zealand and they found out, for instance, uh, our psychological well-being is the best investment a country can do because if we are doing well in psychological terms, then we're actually finding a job, we're getting a boyfriend or a girlfriend, uh, we innovate, we think out of the box, so it's so important. So if we talk about the basic minimal income, it's important to give people bandwidth to be creative, to design things. But for instance, in Denmark, where we almost have a basic income, it's not enough. Because if you tell people, oh, you'll have this income and then stay at home in the sofa, you're ruining their sense of meaning, their sense of purpose. So we need something beside a united basic income. We need to, to have this focus on how can I contribute in society. And that has really come into game uh, during this uh, corona crisis, we had so many examples of people from all angles uh, delivering their resources and their know-how. So uh, now rebuilding society, it's really not just focusing on getting back, it's focusing on the long-term investments. What are the first few steps we can do that will create a, a solution all a way around? Um, and we have a young generation now saying, well, we have to pay for the elderly. We paid for the finance crisis. Now we can't get into the good educations uh, because uh, the, the border is, uh, we're having unemployment and still we are the one who has to have a planet to live on a hundred years from now. So either you work with us or you don't get us on board. And I was speaking with some young people from 50 different countries and they were 16 to 18 years old. They said, we're going to make a green LinkedIn for only companies who are supporting United Nations uh, um, per, uh, goals because we don't want to work for anyone else. We don't want to share our data with anybody else and uh, we don't want to go shopping from anywhere else. So they were very black and white and it's going to be interesting to see if they maintain the environmental agenda uh, on, on, the, on our mindset. And it's not at all completely certain. Then we have the whole uh, question of, of data ethics, that we should maintain control so we get the best out of people, that we're not uh, abusing uh, that power. And that's also very much on the forefront for people selecting their businesses. Who do you, Whose side do you want to be on? You can already see now that people at Facebook, they are demonstrating against their own manager. So, so you have a lot of uh, interesting trends here. I'm running through this area very fast so we can go to questions, but it's, it's a huge transformation that is happening right here. <laughs> So for me, she's pacified. She has the big society telling her what to do and 
I'm not saying our gov uh, our minister has been as bad, but you know you can tell people so much what to do that they think they can't think and they can't do anything by themselves. And that could well be the losers of the future, if I'm putting it. I know I have to say interesting, exciting, but if you're stifled, if you are locked into what algorithms are telling you, what uh, different institutions are telling you, if you're filled with data, uh, and you have lost your own sense. That was why we started hugging ourselves in the beginning, you remember? So it's all about getting the best out of people uh, and the planet. And that only goes if we keep the sensation of what is good for you. And I think the next 10 years, we will find that we do not need one size fit all. We need many sizes fit different people. And we need to have the mindset that hey, this is a huge playground. It has probably never been so safe and so good to be born in society. And we are very lucky to be alive in this point uh, in, in the, the world history, especially as women, because we can actually pick our own future. And we have a huge uh, selection to choose from. And we have many ideas out there. And we can pick those that fit us the best. So really moving from work system dictating to life detecting our balance and our future. So um, as I said, uh, I have a book coming out on the 21st of June, Aftershocks and Opportunities, written together with futurists all around the world. And we have many different visions, so you will be confused at a higher level. Um, and otherwise, we have an online transporting masterclass that you're very uh, welcome to join as well, where I go in and I correct assignments and give comments, but it's online. And I think that's, that's it for me. And now I'm gonna turn off this one, Caroline, and we have time for questions. Yes, and already there are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, they are, some of them are focusing a little bit on the, on the work-life balance, uh, which I think a lot of us uh, young professionals working for, uh, for big companies are interested in. So if you could talk a little bit more about, maybe you can just read the questions. Uh, but talk about how uh, how big companies are adapting to this new uh, um, truth. Yeah, if you read it out, more so it's more specific, Carolina. Yes. Um, no. What's your thought on the work anywhere trend, rate up and down size for employees? Here, thinking about Facebook saying decrease in pay if moving out, and more use of cheaper third third world labor if people work digitally, anyways. So this going back to the digital nomad. Um, so uh, to, to do the just in time uh, and just in case where I talked about the local collaboration, um, I think all what we talk about knowledge sharing is going global and manufacturing and physical stuff is going local. So anything you can produce, any physical stuff, um, tangible things, they need to be close by also for uh, the environmental footprint sake. So, uh, so there's a, a kind of, of difference there. So there's no doubt that the vaccine is gonna come a lot sooner if Chinese uh, scientists are working together with American scientists who are working together with European scientists and so forth. So we need to bring knowledge and the work together. And that is definitely gonna happen no matter what. But um, spreading it out for local situations is still gonna be uh, important. So I like the notion of Global, going global. Uh, in terms of what big companies are doing, well, we have 20% uh, of managers, uh, according to Lederne, uh, a trade union in, in, in Denmark or an organization in Denmark, who say that they will definitely change the working hours for people. And I think uh, it's too little. I think we'll see more because I think the push is going to come from the employees as well as an important thing. And I don't think it's going to be either the home or the company, I think we'll have a lot of pop-up offices as well. So Caroline and I can go to a pop-up office uh, where we meet in the middle. So we don't all have to do the same commuting. So we have much more smarter uh, team setups um, all around the place uh, rather than sticking to one area. And that, of course, again, uh, puts a lot of demands on GDPR and security and bringing your own security along uh, rather than having a firewall around the company, you should have a firewall around yourself. So you see every time you look at the future and you have to say, and then what, and then what? And that's why you always have to look at it from 
from your perspective, what chair are you sitting in? What is your interest in this? And then it's much easier to say, and uh, this will have this and that impact and that, and that time. And I think you answered the second question from Sen about uh, people not needing new offices anymore. Uh, and I Dennis think that... Also talking about uh, the group from 50 countries, you remember it was all the mayors coming together in November uh, 19 and they had a youth, um, but I can uh, definitely give you the link. Uh, I'll put it here in the chat. Uh, so there's a whole report uh, around what this youth was saying. But I was so surprised because the businesses that were there said, oh, we have to strike a compromise and it's not that black and white. And they said, yes, it's extremely easy. We'll just do like that and we'll have blinders on. We don't even want to meet uh, other businesses in the net. So they were very uh, harsh. Real and, then we have a, and then we have a question from, uh, from us in, in, in overseas. Uh, so what about global mobility? Will companies rethink sending employees overseas? Uh, you know, we've, uh, a lot of us have traveled to, to foreign cities to work. How is that we trend going to... We have a feedback crisis. So we will be much better at... Um, I spoke for some, uh, for some career, uh, career centers in Norway and they said one of the mistakes that we have done is that we go in too soon online with people and they don't have the trust in us. So we, you, have to, you have to know, you have to be much more conscious in when do you need to meet. Uh, so, so it's completely stupid to have 200 people sitting in a lecture theater or in a conference hall but it's a really, really good idea to meet the 20 people that you have to your day-to-day -day business with because it's really hard uh, to only meet uh, online and then go deep. Uh, so, so we will, um, I think we will we'll spend our time traveling, going deeper and more conscious. And then I believe very strongly in this pleasure that will combine business and leisure. So we'll be very aware of the environmental points that we take. So when we go, we want to be transformed both as people and as a workforce. So, so uh, I wouldn't just go as I would have in the past, jumped on a plane, gone to London, given you a presentation for an hour and then jump back into the plane. Uh, you will use all kinds of items to, to try to reduce your footprint so you to put packages together for people. So that's going to be a logistic nightmare to, to get all these uh, people to be on the right path. But people will simply feel hungover if they go back to the way it used to be. And then we have a question from Anya. How do you see we can increase innovation working from home, virtual reality, or are there any other technologies helping us on, on the innovation agenda? Um, I, I, uh, I think that actually uh, doing a brainstorm, which we could do on certain issues right here, works really, really well. I mean, the brainstorm part, the generating ideas could work so well here because everybody could get into play and, and we could even put it, we could go out in some group sessions and we could move on. That works really well. I think uh, the moment where we have to decide who does it when and who's paying, that's when it breaks down. And then that's when you suggest you meet uh, in the... In and then the you world. have to meet, and then you have to drink some wine, and you have to find out who's paying the bill. Okay, thanks for that, uh, that advice. We have a question from Nai, who has uh, her son. So as you predict the future, what do you think is the college degree that will benefit the most? Nai, I, I need to hear, did your son stay for an hour? And I'm, what is his name? Hi, so cool. Yeah, you need to unmute yourself now if you want to yeah. talk, but maybe so, you can... Uh, yeah, so Sebastian is here. He's actually building a robot as we've been, oh, cool. as we've been talking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we go and robot for some too. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Cool. So what, uh, what, sh what should we, uh, where should we put our money and investments <laughs> from, from a college perspective? Um, from a college perspective, I think it's so important that that um, uh, that you need to have some hand on as your son is doing right now. I think we have this uh, uh, transformation of educational systems right now where people uh, need to put together various skills to solve new problems. They cannot sit through the traditional five years or four years uh, curricula and then wait for the future to happen. So it needs to be much more integrated as they go along. Uh, all data shows that we have a huge forgetting curve. 
so, so the way we learn today is completely nonsense. So it's basically because the educational system hasn't had any competitors for a long time, but now they do because uh, you can make adaptive learning. So if you just need to just need to learn to code or math or read, you can do that on your own and it will adapt to your learning style and it will know exactly when do you know and when to move to the next level. That is moving really fast ahead. So what you need to do once you go into the college setting, that's where you have to learn the, the courage, you have to learn to make mistakes, you have to learn to sense your frustration and go deeper into that with curiosity, you have to learn to work together with other teams, you have to find out how to listen louder to the stuff you don't know, so you can't Google it, but you need it. Uh, you need to be able to work together with other types of people than you are, because they will allow you to solve the puzzles. So, so again, uh, just like our business life, we'll be far more conscious at to what platform work best for what situation, rather than this one side fit all, we'll be far more aware of, um, how do I feel good? What makes me happy? Um, and then, as I said before, a challenge is that there are a lot of commercial interests who try to make us binge and just get confused. And then we sap on and we sap on. So, so a big challenge is to create a space for us to go really deep. So you don't just look at the baking contest, but you actually get the kids in the kitchen and they bake and they taste and they do and they work and they go deeper while at the same time understanding what sort of value they might create in society. So it's, it's, a, it's a movement like this. Uh, you dive down and then you go up and you orientate and then you dive down again. Yeah. And that goes for the kids, but for what for uh, those without kids? Does it, that's, what's the best uh, advice you can give us in terms of learning? Again, it's, it's uh, in terms of, uh, we talk so much about it and nobody has done anything about it. In Denmark, 97% uh, of our tax money goes to uh, kids until they are 25. And these kids, they're already busy having their own web shops, doing uh, their own YouTube training. Uh, and then they have 3% to lifelong learning. And there, hopefully, uh, Jeff and other parties will find a way so that we also retrain and reorientate. Uh, so, so we're talking about replacing retirement with breaks. And a lot of people actually spend this corona time uh, thinking, hey, hell no, I'm not going to go back to that job. I mean, this is not where I see myself in 10 years. But if you are in the hamster wheel, you never think about it and you don't think about how to transform and how to move. So this has also been a fantastic uh, chance to do that. And I think, um, well, every time I went on maternity leave, I basically came back with a new business idea. And I just hope that this is going to happen for a lot of the guys who now finally had a chance to unplug for a little bit as well, because uh, it's... It's moving from being fast paced to being really slow paced and, and thinking about things. And um, I talked about the uh, universal basic income, but it goes for poverty, for instance, that if you are poor and have to think about how to get uh, bread on the table the next month, you have a 15% lesser IQ than when you're rich. This has been measured on the same group of people uh over the year so it's it's the same person and they can actually see it varies and the same go for our time if we are pushed 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 all the time we never have time to step back and think smart and long uh and and, and in a longer distance so i think uh something we can take away from this is also <sighs> breathe deep use your summer house or use your walk in the park or use nature to to, to make some, some inner journeys to find out uh, what sort of meaning do you want to create in, in society and, and what is uh, making you happy and, and strive. So it shouldn't be based on this woman with the fake post on social media. If that's the feedback we get, we're going to get completely crazy. <laughs> I'm saying that as a mother, not as a futurist. I should say interesting, exciting. <laughs> So we have uh, one final question I think we can make time for from Cecil, who says, what's your perspective on building back better in terms of the green transition restart? 
Uh, first of all, it's really important, uh, just with the pandemic, uh, it goes for the Green Start as well, that we have to work across countries. So, so hopefully we're getting the, the German Macron uh, deal going because then they can put some issues and principles down for, for a green restart. So governments right now are in charge of laying out the architecture uh, of how this environmental journey should go. So they are the ones to look at. And as I said, if nothing happens, we will have a huge backlash from the next generation who will be so angry and so upset. Uh, but hopefully we can do it in a peaceful way, uh, having a long-term uh, rebuilding process where you both solve the environmental issues and you solve the uh, short-term issues on, on getting back on track and getting new jobs to people. Well, thank you so much for taking uh, the time to answer that final question. I think we will uh, start to round off uh, and um, there's just a comment. Um, from, from Naya, that it's out of boredom, comes an abundance of creativity. I couldn't agree anymore. And I would like to thank you so much, Lisa Lotte, for, uh, for taking the time to be with us today. It was uh, energizing, fun, and really, really food for thought on, on the future. Um, so meeting you guys, and I hope you have a happy, fantastic future, and that it has been opening up rather than closing down on you. Yes, and I'll close off the recording now, but we'll stay online for just a few more minutes. Yes, and feel free to ask anything if you like, just unmute. <laughs>